Our second lecture on Plato's Phaedrus, I've entitled Plato's Phonologocentrism. We're going to be looking at uh, questions, uh, not just of the uh, dialogue's content, but also its, its form as, as a work of literature and what Plato's views about uh, literacy are, his orientation to literacy and orality, and how, uh, and then we'll also uh, do a reading in which we, uh, at, the, at the background of all of this is a consideration of, of Jacques Derrida's very famous essay, Plato's Pharmacy, often anthologized from his book, uh, Dissemination. And so we're going to be doing a reading of Plato, but with one eye uh, on, or thinking about, towards thinking about uh, Derrida's uh, approach to this, his deconstruction of it, which is, uh, as I said, in our last lecture at the conclusion, central to any understanding of uh, deconstruction today, and also I would say to literary studies in general. It's just one of those things that if you're a student of literature, it's it's crucial that you know, uh, and I think it'll also help us later in our reading of Derrida and, uh, and Heidegger to understand the critique of, uh, of logocentrism, which is central to deconstructive, the deconstructive uh, enterprise or deconstructive thought itself. Um, and for those of us who are uh, pursuing questions of animality, it'll also tell us a great deal about the relationship between our humanity and our um, animality. Um, since as we're gonna see, Aristotle will define the human being as the rational animal. This is the definition of man that comes down to us from antiquity. You know, what does it mean to be uh, 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 a human being? Well, rationality, logos plus animality equals uh, uh, a human being or humanity or human. Uh, but what, uh, what does it mean to be, what is, what is this thing that we're calling uh, reason or, or the logos? So it's, it's a central question um, which we're going to continue to work on and and explore. Okay, so um, I've uh, defined. I've I've called this uh, uh, um, this lecture. Uh, excuse me, just one second. I'm not having trouble here. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, Plato's phonologocentrism. You can see there an image of of Thoth. He is the uh, the the uh, Egyptian uh, deity who, in um, uh, in Greek thought, becomes associated with Hermes. Many of the deities in the ancient world come to be interchangeable. In the Roman tradition, he's known as Merc Mercury, but he is attributed as the uh, inventor of writing. And Plato tells us this very. Uh, specifically in, in the dialogue Phaedrus that writing was invented by this Egyptian deity. This also is an acknowledgement of uh, Egypt's influence upon uh, uh, ancient uh, Hellenic civil civilization uh, as well. And so you note there, Thoth is the ibis-headed god. Um, he is part animal and part uh, human, as uh, again we said in terms of thinking of animal metamorphosis, uh, that uh, animals and humans um, uh, have long been uh, thought of as uh, able to, tra uh, to transmute their form or to be comprised of both forms. This is something that is uh, particularly prevalent in ancient Egypt, but, in, but throughout antiquity in a more general sense. Um, okay, the word, let me briefly say also the word phono refers to the word that is that is heard with the ears, spoken with the mouth, or heard with the ears. We could, another way to say this is the uh, orality, orality, the, the word orality coming from the or, Latin word oris, which is, you know, the mouth and oral, the, it's, it's the mouth to ear, the, the, the spoken and heard word. Uh, logocentrism of Plato to, to uh, break it down even further. Okay, um, now in Timaeus, uh, we find a really interesting uh, dialogue here, uh, wh which we, we've already uh, talked about the Phaedrus, but we didn't really talk much about the way in Phaedrus, excuse me, in Timaeus, that, uh, that uh, the, the role that Egypt plays in that. And at the very beginning of the dialogue before 
uh, Timaeus uh, gives us a discourse on the world's creation. He speaks a little bit about how ancient Egypt is in comparison to Hellenic civilization. In fact, uh, the Egyptians, uh, you know, he, he tells us or describes for us how the Egyptians consider the Greeks to be mere children. And part of the reason for this is because uh, Egypt has writing, uh, alphabetic literacy uh, at this time and uh, or prior to Hellenic civilizations, uh, prior to the uh, entry of literacy into, into uh, Greece. Uh, and so uh, consequently they have archives that the Greeks do not. And so the, the, in effect, the, he tells us that the Greeks don't even know their own history. And so he's going to tell us the history uh, for us or for the Greeks. And um, he does so um, uh, with reference to this really fascinating story about uh, the lost continent of Atlantis, which is said to have been there long before, uh, you know, uh, the days of Socrates. All right, so let's take a moment and uh, read this quote from Timaeus. Uh, Plato says, whatever happened either in your country or ours has been written down by us, this is an Egyptian speaking of old and preserved in our temples. Whereas uh, just when you and other nations are only now being provided with letters and the other prerequisites of civilized life. Uh, you do not know that there formerly dwelt in your land the fairest and noblest race of men who ever lived, and that you and your whole city are, are from a remnant of them that has survived. And this was unknown to you because for many generations the survivors died, leaving no written word. Many great and wonderful deeds of your state are recorded in our written histories. You Helens are never anything but children, and there is not an old man among you, for there is no opinion handed down among you by tradition. All right, so uh, interesting, uh, th something to think about. You know, uh, Egypt is often called uh, the mother of the world. The Egyptian civilization is quite ancient, and uh, there's a lot of debate about where alphabetic you know, literacy comes from. It, 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 did it develop in other places simultaneously? This is perhaps possible, but we certainly know that uh, that literacy, alphabetic literacy, that is, comes to uh, comes to Athens, comes to the Greeks uh, via the Phoenicians, and prior to its uh, entry from the Phoenicians, it came to the Phoenicians via uh, uh, ancient Egypt, and so. Uh, the knowledge of alphabetic literacy has this this entry into 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 Greece via Egypt and uh, Egypt via the Phoenicians and um, it's uh, I should note briefly that alphabetic literacy means essentially you know uh, you know letters that refer to sounds rather than say a pictograph which is a you know, it would be an image that refers to an object that exists, say, in the ontological world. So this, it's this, it's precisely this innovation of of, of letters referring to uh, to sounds rather than uh, to, to to things that enables a, a, an enormous uh, technological advancement in human civilization. And it was there in Egypt, you know, long before it came to to Greece. Uh, this was this was not known uh, for a long time uh, because there were many misconceptions about uh, the hieroglyphs in Egypt and the knowledge of the ability to read hieroglyphs was was lost for nearly 2,000 years. And so uh, consequently, there, there, there were many mis misconceptions that circulated until the uh, hieroglyphs were cracked, until the Rosetta Stone was discovered. And, and knowledge of the uh, Egyptians' alphabetic literacy uh, came to be more widely known. And we're only now translating a lot of these texts uh, that because there's so many uh, writings in Egypt that we found and, and uh, many of them, I mean, we've, we've known, we've had the knowledge to read them for over a hundred years, but uh, what, what they mean is another matter and, 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 and the volume of texts that are out there is also can be uh, overwhelming. Okay, so uh, um, 
here are some important dates to just survey this. You can see alphabetic literacy in Egypt. This was uh, some 1700 years before Christ is when it emerged. Um, and uh, the Homeric epics were written around 762, uh, uh, 762 years before Christ or before, in the common era, for the common era. And, uh, and Plato's dialogues that we're studying were written around, you know, between 428 and 347 common era. Uh, so um, Plato is, is effectively a latecomer to uh, 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 literacy, given the fact that it so widely prevailed in the ancient world long before the time of Plato. Uh, but as you can see there on the far uh, right, there is an image of the Rosetta Stone at the very top, it was inscribed in hieroglyphic uh, writing. And you can see there on the left, some examples of hieroglyphic writing. And then the middle part, you had the demotic. You can see the demotic at, at the bottom. This is a kind of a cursive form of hieroglyphic writing. It was, the, the, it was long, uh, uh, the words themselves come from Greek, the Greek uh, language. And there was a, a misconception that the demotic being, you know, like from the same root as the word uh, democracy, the, the 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 feeling or the thinking that people had the, the misconception that they had was that they thought that the demotic was a um was it was a, a kind of a writing for the common people the, the, in a, a more democratic writing for instance uh, whereas the hieroglyphic was a more esoteric uh religious discourse that only the high priests knew a kind of a secret uh, hermetic uh knowledge uh, this was a, a, a simply a a mistake in thinking, um, the 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 bottom of the Rosetta Stone was a it was inscribed in in the Greek alphabet, and this was what provided uh, in the time of of Nap when Napoleon invaded Egypt in 1799. This was the this was what provided, uh, and the stone was discovered. A Frenchman named Champion was the was the person who cracked the Rosetta Stone. And it was the not it was the cartouches that helped him do this. You can see there in the middle the cartouches. Now the cartouches are names, and he and they found names on the Rosetta Stone. You know the names of famous Egyptians, for instance Cleopatra, and uh, and, and it was through examining the cartouches that they discovered that there was an alphabetic component to Egyptian writing, and this led to this. Uh, uh, amazing discovery that finally enabled, after a couple thousand years, pretty much, uh, these these uh, this writing to be uh, deciphered. Okay, now what what you see here, um, it's an interesting uh, graph. If you look at the far left, you see uh, of, of, there are two columns here. Let's look at the first column for just a minute. At the far left, you see instances of uh, of Egyptian writing. And then on the far right, you see the Roman alphabet. And then uh, uh, right before the Roman alphabet, you see the Greek alphabet. And then before the Greek alphabet, you see the Phoenician alphabet. And, and then before that, between the Phoenician alphabet and the Egyptian alphabet, uh, you see uh, the what's called the Proto-Sinaitic uh, uh, alphabet. Now, this was these were inscriptions found in the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, that that provided a clue to sort of the, a link between uh, the Egyptian uh, alphabetic uh, alf uh, alphabet and the uh, uh, and, and the European alphabet that that evolved. But if you look, if you take a moment and look at some of these characters, for instance, uh, look at on the second column, uh, look at the letter N. You can see that it's a kind of a snake. And the snake transmutes into an N, or right below that is an I. The I becomes uh, an O. Uh, a little further down, you can see the evolution of the T, uh, the Y, and so forth and so on. And so, what 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 effectively happens uh, as the alphabet evolves is that the reference to the ontological world or to the world of material things begins to disappear, and it becomes a more purely abstract alphabet. Some have linked this question, like Freud, for instance, in his book, Moses and Monotheism, links this question to uh, the ban on graven images in the Abrahamic traditions. 
uh, because the ancient Egyptian uh, alphabetic characters were also they they were they were signs in the sense that they were things things that pointed to other things, which is the Augustinian definition of the sign in, in Western semiotics that gets handed down in, in Europe to us. Uh, but uh, in in Egypt, the signs were not only things that pointed to other things to uh, uh, to to sounds or a thing that points to another thing in the Augustinian view, but is insignificant in itself. They were also things that were significant in themselves, as because they were believed to be imbued with a kind of a divine power, and so this they were in effect amulets as well as alphabetic characters. And so for this reason, people would wear these uh, uh, amulets that, that were you know. Uh, Alpha, hieroglyphic signs that also were alphabetic signs around their neck. For instance, if you look at the O, you think of the uh, the Eye of Horus, which is even today people wear to eat off, ward off the uh, evil eye, um, or the Coptic cross, which uh, came from the T. So there, on, on the one hand, in, in Egypt, they were alphabetic signs, uh, but they were also uh, uh, magical amulets that that could protect the person wearing them from uh, calamitous events uh, in, in, in the world, or, or they were, let's say they were uh, objects imbued with, with a kind of a divine energy or power, uh, and rather than being, you know, empty in and of themselves in the Augustinian sense, or just things that point to other things but are insignificant in themselves. So again, we see this process of abstraction that develops, and that's worth uh, noting, okay? Now, all of this raises questions about um, the extent to which Greek civilization is indeed indebted to Egyptian civilization. There are a lot of debates about this out there. And I just, I, in passing, I like to draw your attention to, to these debates um, because it's, it's caused, uh, you know, a kind of a, a furor in the, uh, in the academy, or at least it did a number of years back um, when uh, Martin Bernal wrote his book, um, Black Athena, uh, suggesting that uh, Athens was, effect was effectively a colony of ancient uh, Egypt. This led classicists, uh, Greek cl classical scholars like uh, Mary Leftowitz to, um, you know, to, to uh, write, you know, very serious rejoinders to this uh, argument. And um, uh, you can see there uh, Mary Leftowitz's book on the far right, which she wrote entitled "Not Out of Africa." This was the uh, uh, this this uh, you know the sort of the, the the conservative forces, academic forces on the right, you know, rejecting this argument as a form of this Afrocentric argument as a form of political correctness. So these these debates are these sort of tires often tiresome debates are with us even today. My own view is that I don't think there's, I don't think it's, uh, I think it's indisputable that uh, 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 ancient uh, Hellenic civilization owes a great deal to the, uh, to, to Egyptian uh, culture and civilization. Bernard explores this, I reckon, but you, you know, you can read these texts and decide for yourself. Now a lot of, but, but, pre, but what precedes all of these debates uh, it would be the writings of the, uh, the uh, Senegalese uh, philosopher and Egyptologist scientist Sheikh Anta Deop, for whom Sheikh Anta Deop University in uh, uh, Dakar is named, the largest university in Senegal, and he explored these questions long before uh, Bernard. Uh, and of course, they were at, at the time that he uh, wrote his book, *The African Origin of Civilization*. Uh, this this was viewed as very controversial. In Europe, and it remains very controversial today. Not so much for uh, the people of Senegal. Uh, one, one of the things that uh, uh, Diop suggests as well is that African society owes a debt to Egypt, much like the debt that European society owes to uh, to, to Greco-Roman uh, civilization. That, and we can continue to see enduring. Uh, evidence of Egypt's influence uh, in, in Africa today, as well as in Europe. Okay, but in the case of Plato, uh, Plato is, um, you know, he's going to very forthrightly, uh, against the view, say, of Mary Leftowitz, very forthrightly suggest that writing comes to 
uh, to ancient uh, Greece through the influence of the Egyptians. And he's going to attribute the invention of writing to uh, the deity Thoth. Okay, and so I sh I, you can see some images here. Um, Thoth is there. You can see him from the uh, Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Book of Coming Forth by Day, uh, by, uh, uh, by this Egyptian scribe Ani, which is perhaps the most beautifully preserved uh, uh, Book of the Dead that comes down to us. There are many, many books of the dead. However, these were essentially scrolls thrown into people's coffins that would provide maps for them to enable them to find the underworld. But, but here you see Thoth. The ibis had a god with his beak and he's got he's he's kind of the wood like a woodpecker he's pecking making pecking marks into this board as we said earlier he's inscribing on his name into the book of life now in in the greek tradition you see to the to the far right there's hermes who uh is is uh is a um, avatar in effect or another uh an equivalent of the of the deity Thoth for the Greeks, and so there's this sort of conflation or relationship between Thoth and Hermes. Um, in the myth of writings origins that that Plato uh, uh, passes down to us, uh, you, it's he also refers to uh, the Greek, or excuse me, the Egyptian god Amon, who is in this uh, little narrative described as as Thamus, given the name Thamus. Uh, Amon is the same, you know. For instance, at, at the end of the Lord's Prayer, of every prayer one says, Amen, which is which is etymologically linked to this figure, Amon. He was this sort of presiding uh, deity, much like we saw in the in the Timaeus stories. Um, when we spoke of the Guan and the Many, uh, a father deity. And so Amon in, uh, uh, in, in the Greek tradition comes to be uh, associated with, with Zeus or with the figure. Zeus, and you can see there. Here is uh, an Amon Zeus uh, uh, image or deity in in the Hellenic uh, in, in Hellenic civilization. Okay, so let's take a moment and read Plato's little uh, parable here, uh, or, or story narrative of writings invention. Plato says, "I heard that near uh, Necrotus in Egypt there was one of the ancient gods whose sacred bird they call Ibis." The name of this divinity was Thoth. He was the first to discover number and calculation, as well as geometry and astronomy, besides the games of droughts and dice. Uh, but especially he invented letters. At that time, the king of all Egypt was Thamus, who ruled from the great city of the upper kingdom, which the Greeks call Egyptian Thebes. And Thamus they call the god Amon. Coming to Thebes, Thoth showed all his arts and said that they must be distributed to the rest of the Egyptians. But Thamus asked what benefit there might be in each art. After Thoth explained the merit of each, Thamus uh, censored some and praised others depending on their utility. Now there you can see that the image that you see there uh, on the right there at the bottom is an image. These are from uh, Egyptian uh, Museum in Cairo, Museum of Antiquity in Cairo. Uh, and uh, these are these are dice, okay? And so Thoth invents writing, but he also invents dice. And you can you can imagine those dice there as being created, in each case from a peck, of of of, of his writing implement. So writing is a, is a, is is for the Egyptians a kind of a mark making, a pecking, a cutting. You know, it's very similar to, in the uh, 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 the, the the Hebraic tradition, where one thinks of. Uh, uh, you know, with this word um, uh, for, for uh, you know, milha, which means, you know, on the one hand, it means to give a name, but it also means to cut. And so writing is a kind of a mark, a cut, a back, a, 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 a kind of like a, think of Thoth as kind of a woodpecker who leaves a little peck into the, uh, in, into the wood. Okay. Um, so let's, let's continue. Uh, the story goes that Thamus said, Thamus said many things to Thoth about each art, both pro and con, the details of which would take too long to go through. When speaking about letters, Thoth said, This branch of learning, my king, will make the Egyptians wiser and will improve their memory. The drug, pharmacon, for memory and wisdom has been discovered. Okay. Um, I want to pause for a minute on this word uh, pharmacon here, because as we're going to see, 
this word pharmacon is is going to be very central to uh, the deconstructive approach to this uh, dialogue and to Derrida's famous uh, uh, essay from dissemination entitled Plato's Pharmacy. Um, the word pharmacon itself is the same. It comes from the word, you know, same word pharmacy, which I'm sure you're familiar with, which is the word for uh, drug, obviously. And so it's, we're going to see it's very interesting that Plato is going, or, or Socrates via Plato is going to describe a writing as a kind, he's going to compare it, he's going to call it a pharmacon or a kind of a drug. Um, and it's a drug that will, um, um, he's going to argue, produce forgetting uh, in, in the minds of those who, uh, uh, who uh, uh, adhere too closely to it. Okay, and so um, uh, let's let's note here. He says again. Um, let's let's continue uh, with this uh, for a minute. Uh, but I want to show you here um, this image here. This is uh, I want to just draw your attention to a, a very famous essay, which I think will help us to understand that what what's going on here uh, in in Plato's writings. Uh, and, and in Derrida's critique of Plato's writings, uh, and then this is a, a little uh, essay by the sophist Gorgias entitled Encomium to Helen, which you can easily find on the internet. And here Gorgias is going to say, um, I quote, the, the effect of speech upon the soul is comparable to the power of drugs over the nature of bodies. Okay, now what you see here in these two images uh, on the on the on the right, or you see picture of a contemporary uh, still from the from the film Troy of Paris and Helen, and in the middle you see a, a, a Renaissance era a painting of Paris and and Helen. Now in the story uh, from uh, that's passed down to us from Homer, uh, it's it's Helen is is the, is the is the great beauty who's described as the face that launched a thousand ships. And she falls in love with Paris and leaves her husband Menelaus and flees with Paris to Troy, and this is what's said to set off the uh, uh, the, the the Trojan War, um, which is the subject of of, of Homer's uh, the Iliad. Now, um, in, in Gorgias' speech, an encomium is a praise, and so he's singing the praises of Helen. He's essentially apologizing for Helen or defending her. And, and for having, you know, run away. And but, but basically what he says is that, you know, when she ran away with Paris, part of the reason why she ran away was because his, his words were so seductive. And, and he compares the words that he spoke to a kind of a poisoning. It's as if he, it's, it's as if he poured poison into the portals of her ears, much like, uh, much like happens in Shakespeare's play Hamlet. When, uh, when, when, the, when Hamlet's uh, uncle pours poison into the ears of his father. Uh, and so uh, effectively, uh, Gorgias is saying, look, it's not, it's not Helen's fault because Paris's words were so powerful. They, it was as if she was drugged. He drugged her. Uh, I guess this would be a, a, a classical instance of roofing. You know, he, 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 he seduced her by drugging her and it was his words that were the drug that seduced her okay so i note this because for gorgias unlike for plato in this dialogue the oral word the oral oral word this the spoken word is 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 akin to a a, a drug but we're going to see in the case of plato that plato is is going to associate writing with the pharmacon but he's not going to say the same about orality all right, this, this would have seemed strange to Gorgias. Now, now the, the view of Gorgias that the word is a kind of a pharmacon is very similar to the ancient Egyptian view. Um, the, the Egyptians called the word, the spoken word, uh, heka, which was the, uh, etymologically speaking, which is the word we get uh, from magic from. It was, it's, it's a kind of a magic. So the words were magical powers. But as for, the, as for Gorgias, as for the Egyptians, uh, the word was, we, we can think of the, this uh, concept of the word or thinking of the word as a kind of an occult uh, materialism because the, because it's really there, the word is really there. Think of in, in terms of the primal elements, we can think of the spoken word as being, you know, wind plus saliva, you know, literally the fluids of the body 
Uh, so it's it's really there. It's it's in, in in the in the realm of becoming, to put it in Platonic terms. Uh, but it's it's not uh, uh, merely uh, an empty word, but much like the amulets that we were just examining, it's a word that is imbued or laced with a kind of a, a, a drug, like the, and it therefore has the power of drugs. Now, what Plato's going to do is he's going to say uh, that the that the written word is akin to a pharmacon that can drug us. Uh, not not so much like or, or in this case can cause you know forgetting in the soul uh, but not uh, the, the spoken word interestingly enough the spoken word for Plato is not akin to the pharmacon as it is for say Gorgias or as as it would have been for the ancient Egyptians okay so here's the king's response to Thoth in this uh, in this platonic uh, parable of sorts uh, the king says or Amman says to Thoth O Thoth, the greatest of technicians, one person is granted the ability to beget the things of art, another the ability to judge what measure of harm and benefit they hold for those who intend to use them. And now you, father of these letters, having your fondness for them, said what is the opposite of the real effect. For this will produce, this, uh, this invention that you created, writing, will produce a forgetting in the souls of those who learn these letters as they fail to exercise their memory. Uh, because those who put their trust in writing recollect from outside with foreign signs rather than themselves recollecting uh, from within by themselves. Okay, uh, note here, I, I wanna pause for just a moment on this because uh, if you read, for instance, uh, the writings of uh, say, uh, theorists of morality literacy differences like Jack Goody and Walter Ong, among others, um, this is something that, they're, that they constantly are uh, discussing. Now, Ong was a, uh, a Jesuit priest and his views are rather sort of straightforwardly uh, logocentric and not at all uh, out of alignment with, with Catholic uh, theology. Um, and so therefore, uh, arguably uh, vulnerable to deconstruction. Uh, but uh, they, they, they may, he, he, well, Ong is definitely worth reading. I recommend reading him because like his book, like Orality and Literacy, for instance, because he makes some really good points. And one of the points that Ong and, and Goody and Havelock and others make is that, um, um, when with with the invention of writing does indeed come uh, forgetting uh, oral oral societies uh, tend to necessarily uh, have you know people that inhabit these societies necessarily have have far better uh, memories than um, those of us who live in advanced uh, industrial literate uh, societies uh, because one is is compelled to rely upon one's memory I, I cite, for instance, the example of the West African griots who have amazing memories and ability to, and, and, and that's part of their job is to, is to transmit a culture's uh, collected wisdom and heritage down through the ages. So uh, there is something here to whether one adopts a deconstructive position or a more logocentric position like Walter Ong, uh, there's, there's definitely something to what uh, uh, Amon or Thamus is saying here. Um, so, all right, well, let's continue. He says, uh, you have not discovered a drug for memory, but for reminding, all right? Okay, another, another interesting point here. Uh, and, uh, and so this is one of the reasons why, you know, we're gonna see Plato's gonna describe writing as a kind of a dangerous supplement to speaking, but it does have the value of this as in dangerous, but necessary. And one of the virtues of writing that he will affirm is that it can it can goad us it can serve as a mnemonic device it can it can uh, goad us into you know remembering things but but in itself it's what is inside of us that is significant that that, that writing goads us into uh, into remembering so it does serve this positive function for Plato you know much like let's say you know we said Aristotle's uh, esoteric te uh, writings were. Uh, you know, were, were his lecture notes. And so we don't know what Aristotle would have really said when he was, you know, lecturing from these notes, but those notes served the purpose of, 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 of helping him to, uh, you know, remember a particular, uh, like his, uh, for when people get old, uh, they often forget, you know, what they said a long time ago. 